today we're talking about rigid body kinematics, focusing on the matrix way of describing two frames. So this is in chapter three of the book, like the first few sections where it talks about the direction cosine matrix. And eventually we'll get to other ways to parametrize these matrices, but the matrix, this matrix is the simplest, I think, conceptual way to understand how you describe the orientation of two frames with respect to each other. So we're gonna start out in 2D and then 3D. So if you remember, if we're, we're looking at rigid body kinematics, so that means, you know, here's a rigid body, how's it oriented in space? We first need to attach a frame to it. So we've got unit vectors, B1, B2, B3, and how are those changing with respect to some reference frame, usually an inertial frame, could be some other frame though, but we want to relate how these, the B1, B2, and B3 vectors are changing with respect to N1, N2, and N3. Hopefully you're, you're getting the idea. To describe the orientation of a rigid body, orientation or attitude of a rigid body compared to a reference frame, we first need to consider a frame attached to that body and then go about describing how that body fixed frame is related to some reference frame. So that's the procedure. So we're mostly kind of abstracting away, oh, there's no rigid body. It's just a frame that's attached to the rigid body. And by frame, I mean the just the three unit vectors that are related by the right-hand rule, B1, B2, and B1 cross B2 is B3. Has to be a right-handed coordinate system. No messing around with those left-handed coordinate systems, of which there are. It's just a convention chosen hundreds of years ago, all right? But now it's what we got. So we'll start in 2D and then go to 3D. 2D, rigid body kinematics. And we'll develop a lot of the machinery here, I think, so that it'll make it easier when we take the step to 3D. So we've got a, a body, and I'll just draw rectangle. And we've picked some, we're going to attach a frame to this. And by attach a frame, I mean we've attached unit vectors. Don't worry right now about, oh, what's the origin? Don't worry about that. That's not important right now. And then we've got um, an inertial frame, N1, N2. So the goal is to uh, relate the B unit vectors. So I'll say the collection. B1 and B2 to N1, N2. So basically the orientation of the body fixed B frame with respect to this N frame. So how do we do that? Well, instead of thinking of them as having different origins, you just sort of overlay them as putting the tail of the vector at the same place. So by tail of the vector, I mean, you, you, know, you, you pick a point and then we've got N1 and N2 and then B1, B2. And I'm just showing it at some arbitrary orientation. As a rigid body moves, that orientation will change. But just imagine one particular orientation. Here's an orientation. Okay, so how would we describe this? The book uses something it calls the direction cosine matrix, which means we relate, we write the B and N unit vectors in a particular way. We want to write the B unit vectors as something times N1 plus something times N2, etc. Something N1 plus something N2. And what is that something? Between any two vectors, right, and think of N1 and N2. N1 and N2, there's an angle, I'll call it alpha 1, 1. And B1 dotted with N1 is the cosine of the angle between them. If you take two vectors and take their dot product, right, you get cosine of the angle between them times the magnitude of the two vectors. But in this case, because we're talking about unit vectors, these are each just one. So it's cosine alpha one, one. And how would we represent that here if we wanted to? So that means the projection of B1 onto N1 
So we could think of it as if you were to take this and project it onto here, it's this distance, but we'll put it up here, write it up there. So it's like the component of B1 along the N1 direction. So this is cosine alpha one, one. We could describe this angle, I'll call that alpha one, two. So B1 dotted with N2 is cosine alpha one, two. And that describes the projection of B1 along N2. In this case, I've made it smaller. So it'd be like that distance. We'll say it's, it's, it's this distance here, cosine alpha one, two. And we could do the same thing for B2. But first of all, let's try to fill in what this, this gap is up here, where I wrote just parentheses. This is actually B1 dotted with N1. And in this parentheses, it's B1 dotted with N2, right? It's giving the projection along the N1 direction and the N2 direction of that B1 unit vector. So we could just fill in, well, we'll call this cosine alpha one one and this we'll call cosine alpha one two and maybe you could see where this is going we're going to define two more angles this is get, getting a little cluttered here so maybe i'll repeat it down here to describe what we've got for b2 this angle is alpha two one and what's the other angle? This angle is alpha two, two. And um, the projection of B2 onto N1, we could, add, we could write it either up here or write it that way. So this is cosine of alpha two, one. And this is cosine of alpha two, two. So then we could fill in all of the rest of these. This over here, this is B2 dotted with N1, B2 dotted with N2, and then just fill in what it is. It's cosine alpha two, two, cosine alpha two, one, all right, so we, we've got B1, we'll kind of summarize this. B1 equals, we'll write it in this sort of weird matrix form, cosine alpha one, one, cosine alpha one, two times, and now this is, it's a bit odd, and the book calls it vectrix notation. But basically you're making a vector that's got these unit vectors in it. So it's technically not a vector. The book calls this a vectrix. Why, why is it not a vector? Because it's entries are unit vectors. It's just a compact notation to make this easier. So if we do that, and then same thing or similar thing for B2, this is cosine alpha two one, cosine alpha two two, as a row vector times n1, n2. Then we could combine these and then we've got this. So we're relating the b unit vectors to the n unit vectors. So the first row is uh, what we've uh, got up above. Cosine alpha 1, 1, cosine alpha 1, 2, cosine alpha 2, 1, cosine alpha two, two, and one and two. So the book would call this matrix C for the direction cosine matrix, because we're describing everything in terms of cosines of these angles, four angles. And the direction cosine matrix is a rotation matrix meaning it's a orthogonal matrix. So if you remember your property of matrices, what does that mean? That means that C inverse 
is equal to C transpose. So C transpose times C is equal in this case to the two by two identity. And same thing if we were to reverse the order, C times C transpose. This is a two by two identity matrix. And now, as you've probably noticed, we don't actually need four angles. We're, we know how to do rotations in 2D and we don't need four angles because they're all related to each other. All we need is one angle. So why aren't we using the one angle? Well, we could, we definitely could, right? Because we could notice up here, uh, alpha one, one. Let's just say that, we'll just say that uh, theta equals alpha one, one. And then we notice, well, then that's the same as actually alpha one, two, two. And what about the other two angles? Well, uh, alpha two, one is, and I'll use radians, so pi over two plus theta. And alpha one, two, that's the one up here. It's actually pi over two minus theta. So it's looking like everything can be described in terms of one angle theta. And then what? Um, well, cosine of alpha two one is equal to negative sine theta by trig identities and cosine of alpha one two is equal to sine theta. So really this matrix C, we know that instead of four angles, it can be parameterized by just one angle. So C is really big, you know, because it's, it's a rotation matrix, it's really just a function of one angle, a, not a junction, a function. We, we might say the matrix C is parameterized by that angle. So I can write it that way. And then what is this? Uh, cosine theta um, up here, sine theta, down here, negative sine theta, cosine theta. So looking ahead, we might say that because we parameterized this matrix in terms of one angle, we have the savings. Instead of having four angles, it's just one. We would call theta our Euler angle. We just have one Euler angle. Euler angles don't typically get exciting until you get to uh, 3D rigid body rotations. But I'm doing this stuff with the cosine because that helps when we take the leap to 3D. It's not obvious what the few matrices will be. In this case, it is. It's this angle theta that we're used to writing. Another way that we could have written this would be to make a table. If we made a table relating the N1 directions and the N2 directions with the B1 and B2 directions, we could make a table and the entries will look exactly like the entries of this matrix. And remember what this table, oops, represents. This table represents inside each of the boxes, you, you take the dot product. So this would be you know, B1 dotted with N1 and so on, but we'll just substitute in what it is. So in this, we get cosine theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, cosine theta. So the matrix uh, C, it uh, summarizes the relationship between the unit vectors. It's a rotation matrix. It relates, if you wanted to know, when you know what are, what's the B, what are the B directions? In terms of the n directions, well, it's all summarized by that matrix. In general, if we're to be following how a rigid body, you know, moves, well, the, the C matrix is going to be changing with time, meaning all of these entries are changing. Or you could think of it as just the Euler angle is changing. So in general, C is going to be changing with time. And because we know it's related to that, how that angle theta changes, say, well, that's how theta is changing with time. When we get to Euler angles, there will be more than one angle. There'll actually be three angles. You need a minimum of three 
numbers, three angles to parameterize a three-dimensional rotation matrix. But we're not quite there yet. There's other things that we could do with this C matrix that make it very useful. The matrix describes how any vectors seen in one frame, uh, what they look like in another frame. Meaning if we write the components of a vector in the B frame, how is it related to the components of that vector in uh, the end frame? So that's useful because when we get to rigid body dynamics, we're gonna to wanna to describe how things um, in the body fixed frame, say a point on the body, how is it changing as seen by the inertial frame? So we've got, um, we've got this up here. I'll just write this as C for now. And the book, to make the description easier, it says define B hat with some squiggly brackets as representing this vectrix of unit vectors and the same for N. N with squiggly brackets represents this column vector of unit vectors, a vectrix. And then the compact way to write this would be, we'd say B, the B unit vectors, as long as you write them as a column, are related to the N unit vectors through this rotation matrix C. But there's more to it. Like I was saying, you can describe vectors seen in one frame compared with another frame. So let me do my sketch of the, the frames. We got N1, N2, B1, B2. Now I'm going to draw a vector, but it doesn't, um, I'll write V just because V for vector. But this doesn't mean velocity. So V is just some vector. So any vector V can be written with components in the B frame. And I guess I'll, instead of just saying B frame, I'll just say in B or in N. What do I mean by that? I mean, you could write the vector V as being V, B1 in the B1 direction plus V, B2, the B2 direction. I could also write that same vector in terms of N components. So I'll write the N1 component is the scalar VN1 in the N1 direction plus VN2 in the N2 direction. And we could write these, each of these compactly in terms of, uh, I'll write it this way, VB1, VB2, that's a, a row vector times column vector, B1, B2. Or I could write it this way, right? VB1, VB2, transpose times the B vectrix. And the exact, I could do the exact same thing for writing the, the same vector V, but in terms of N components. So VN1, VN2 times the N1, N2 vectrix. Or if I wanna stack these up and then remind myself this is transpose N. And to make this even more compact, the book uses the notation. It writes this as V, V sub B, where it's understood this is a column vector of the components with respect to the B frame times B. And same over here. This is V N squiggles transpose. And, and we could just remind ourselves, what is this VN? What does that mean? This just means it's the column vector of the components in the N direction. Same over here. V, B, it's a column vector of the components with respect to the B unit vectors. Now, both of these are just different ways of describing the vector V. 
and the vector v is the same in both. So we could start from v equals v and then get a relationship between the uh, components in the b frame and the components in the n frame. Let me just write it. v equals v. That's, that makes sense. But on one side, I'll write it in terms of the B unit vectors. Um, so maybe the left-hand side. B, oops, let me write it this way. V, B, transpose times B equals, and on the right-hand side, I'll write it. V, N, transpose N. But now I can substitute it in that I know how the B unit vectors are related to the N unit vectors. B is related to N via that matrix C. B equals C N. So let me then substitute in, right, I've got B over here. So I'll just substitute in, this is V, B transpose C matrix n, that's the left-hand side. Right-hand side stays the same, v, n, transpose, n. And this needs to hold for all sets of basis vectors n. This is a technical math thing. You might just already see what's going on. I can basically cancel out the n's, but it's it, it holds for all n, meaning that v, b, transpose C equals V N transpose. I don't want to write this in terms of transpose. So if I take the transpose of both sides, I'll get C transpose V B equals V N. Okay. And it's probably easier if I just sort of rearrange how I'm writing that V N equals C transpose VB. So this is helpful if I had the, the, the components in terms of the B frame and I wanna know what are these components in terms of the N frame, but maybe I want to go the other way. Well, I could use the fact that this is a rotation matrix and just multiply both sides by C. So this is true, this is, this is useful, right? Because it relates, it says that VN1 Vn2 equals this C matrix, Vb1, Vb2. But I could also take or multiply both sides by C transpose, not C transpose, multiply both sides by, and this is a transpose up here, by C. If I multiply both sides by C, then I'll get C times C transpose on this right-hand side, and that's just equal to the identity. So I'll get this. VB equals C VN. So if I have a major, if I have a vector that's written in terms of the inertial frame, this tells me what it looks like with respect to the B frame. It's exactly parallel to what we have written up up here. So this this relates unit vectors. This relates components of vectors. And just like this is Vn equals C transpose B, well, N, if you wanted the N unit vectors in terms of the B unit vectors, then this would be C transpose. You just take this equation up here in the upper right, multiply both sides on the left by C transpose, and you'll get this, okay? So it's you know one rotation matrix to rule them all. And just being careful uh, what, you know, which way you're going. All right, so I think that's it for, for 2D. There's a, there's a few conceptual things here. All right, then, then we're gonna move on to 3D. Here we go. So yeah, the book does not mention 2D. It just sort of dives into 3D, but I think it's really helpful to see 2D because it's fewer terms, easier to think about. But there's gonna be parallels to everything I've said in 3D. So now the 3D rigid body kinematics. Um, and if I had to point to a section, I think it's in section 3.2. So the way I like to 
think of it is we've got our we've got a rigid body. So here's a rigid body. And in the frame of the rigid body, there is, or in right the yeah, the frame of the rigid body, we actually we attach some kind of B1, B2, and B3 directions. And maybe you know, we pick things that make sense. Like if this was some kind of rectangular box thing, yeah, we'd have B1, B2, and B3, and pick them to be perpendicular to each of the faces, just so it's nice and conceptually easy. Well, what we want to know is how do we describe the orientation of this compared to the some end frame directions? So the triad of unit vectors. So in general, this will be doing something I don't know. And so then the unit vectors attached to the body will be, it's kind of hard to draw here, will be like that. And then you could think of the end frame. Don't think of the end frame as you know, far away. You've got the n unit vectors and you just overlay them so that they have the same origin for purposes of describing how the B1, B2, and B3 are related to N1, N2, and N3. So it's like we just parallel transport these N1, N2, and N3 directions. And then we could describe uh, the orientation. So this is the, you've got these B directions, which now using vectrix notation, we just say, oh, it's B, right? And what does this stand for? B1, B2, and B3. And we want to know how those directions are related to the n directions, where little n n hat squiggles is short for this uh, row, a column vector, but where each entry is a unit vector. So it's not it's not technically a, a, a vector. We want to describe, like before, the attitude or the orientation of the b1, b2, and b3 with respect to n1, n2, and n3. And you could probably see where this is going to go. It's going to be a C matrix at some point. So we want to describe B directions with respect to the orientation of those directions with respect to the N directions. So the same sort of thing applies. I'll do another figure here. So this is just showing some kind of arbitrary orientation of the B frame with respect to the N frame. And we'll work with this to try to figure some things out. So just like up above, let's just focus on B1. We want to write B1 in terms of something times N1 plus something times N2 plus something times N3. And what is that something? Well, the kind of compact mathy way to put it is to write B1 dotted with N1. And then this is B1 dotted with N2 plus B1 dotted with N3. It might be tiny and hard to see, but that, that that's what I'm drawing. And we could write all of these in terms of cosines of angles between vectors. So the first one, B1 and N1, there's going to be this angle alpha 1, 1. And where does alpha 1, 1 show up? Um, well, let me draw all, all the angles. So there's alpha one, one, alpha one, two is the angle between B1 and N2. And then what's this angle between uh, B1 and N3? It's gonna be alpha one, three. Okay then. And then we could write the, the projection. Remember these are all unit vectors. So the projection, let me write the projection into here, and then the projection there, and then this projection. Oh no, I'm gonna write through alpha one one. Uh, so all of these are related to uh, cosines of different angles. So how about from here to here, this is cosine alpha, one, one, right? Because that's the project, that's the amount of the projection. If you're having a hard time seeing that, this is the same as the projection of B1 onto N, N1. And I'm just drawing it there. 
So this is cosine alpha one one. And same for the for others. So this is the projection, same as the projection of B1 onto N2. So that is from here to here. Ooh, showed up as red. Uh, cosine alpha one, two. And then what are we left with? This thing, this is cosine alpha one, three. It's the amount, if you want, of um, the projection along B1 projected onto N3. So we've got all these now, cosine alpha one, two, cosine alpha one, three. That was just for B1. We could do this for all of them. And hopefully you, you get it. So B1, we could also write this as uh, cosine alpha one, one. So now I'm writing a row vector, cosine alpha one, two, cosine alpha one, three times N1, N2, N3 in vector form. So we call it a vectrix. And we could remind ourselves what this was. This is just writing the B1 unit vector. Do the same thing for B2 and B3, and then we can combine into a matrix. So that means we'll be defining nine more, ang uh, sorry, three more angles. So there's like nine angles total. Combine into a matrix. So we've got B1, B2, B3 equals. Now I'm going to do a big three by three matrix with a bunch of cosines in it. Cosine alpha one, one. So this is the, you know, the top row will be the same as we have up above. Cosine alpha one, two, cosine alpha one, three. And that's all multiplying n1, n2, n3. And then this will be cosine is the second row. So the first number will be two, alpha two, one, cosine alpha two, two, cosine alpha two, three. And then the last row, cosine alpha three, third row, one, cosine alpha three, two, Cosine alpha three, three. Lots of cosines. So this is the, the direction cosine matrix that we'll call C, put C in a box. And then this, right, using the vectrix notation, this is N squiggly, and this is B squiggly. So the compact way to write this would be B equals C. And just like before with the 2D way, this is the compact way of writing it. And if you look at what these entries are, this matrix C has entries. I guess I'll write it this way. C with index notation I C I J equals B I dotted with N J, which is equal to cosine alpha I J, where alpha is the angle between those two, between B I and N J. So this would relate if you if you wanted to write the B unit vectors in terms of the N unit vectors, you could do that. Again, C is a matrix. It's just a three by three matrix. It's a rotation matrix is what I mean. It's an orthogonal meaning rotation matrix, which means that C inverse is equal to C transpose. So the relationship of N and B would be N equals C 
transpose B. So that's also true. So that's that's a lot. Um, it seems like we would need to find out all of these nine angles, but you know, in analogy with the two by two matrix where we only had one angle. No, we don't actually need nine angles. Uh, this could be parameterized in terms of just three numbers or three angles. And we'll get to that. There's some other things that we needed to look at first. And I guess just like up above, the same thing holds regarding if you have a matrix seen in one frame with a matrix seen in another frame. So just like before, is that, a, I don't know what that is before. If I've got this N frame and then some wacky looking B frame, and then I've got uh, some vector V, I know how to write it in terms of each of the frames. And it's gonna be completely analogous to what we did above for two-dimensional rotations. So where V can be written as VB transpose B. And it could also be written the same vector, right? When we write it as just sort of V, it's independent of what frame. It's just, it's just a vector. I don't have a green one because you couldn't see it <clears throat> with the green screen. But here, you know, here's an orange vector. Just a vector. I could write it with respect to this red frame, or I could write it with respect to this blue frame. Same vector. And of course, the components will look different, and we want to relate uh, how it is. So just like up above, uh, V, you substitute it in and do everything like before. You would get that the VB directions or VB components, it's, this is equal to C times VN. That's the compact notation, right? This is the same as writing VB1, VB2, VB3 equals, I'm not gonna rewrite that cosine matrix, C times VN1, VN2, VN3. So it's the compact and then sort of writing it out more. And then if you wanted to go the other way, then there a, a transpose occurs. So VN equals C transpose of VB. But there's some nice parallelism between these two that I'm connecting with a line, right? The B frame equals the C matrix times the N frame and the components of a vector seen in the B frame equals the C matrix times the components of the vector seen in the N frame. So that's nice, it makes it easier to remember, I think. All right, good. Now there's another property of these matrices that we need to think about. Think about, um, let me bring in that picture again, because I like it. Here is a green frame. I don't know what to draw here. Some kind of green frame. Yeah. Okay, so this is, I'll call this the R, R1, R2, R3. Sound like a pirate. So there's the, a, a common thing that comes up, and this is going to be an important property that we'll need to use, is that if you have multiple frames, so let's, you could call them the cascading reference frames, where each frame is defined with respect to some other frame, but there could be multiple frames. It'd be great to replace each individual rotation with a combined rotation. What do I mean? Okay, so let's suppose we've got these R unit vectors. So we'll say R is related to the B directions by some matrix that we'll call C prime. The basis vectors in uh, of B are related to N in the way that we've been describing, and we've just used the matrix C for that. So we're relating the R unit vectors to B through a rotation matrix C prime. 
the B unit vectors to N through a rotation matrix C, what if we directly wanted to relate the R unit vectors and the N unit vectors? How would we do that? Well, we would take, right, we'd start with what we have up above, C prime B, and then substitute in, right, here's B, here's B. Now substitute in what B equals. It equals C times N. So this equals C prime times C N. And we can refer to this matrix as a, it's a rotation times a rotation. And the nice property of rotation matrices is that when you do matrix multiplication of them, you end up with another rotation matrix. So C, we'll call this C prime prime, is another rotation matrix. Got that? So R, if we wanted to directly relate the R unit vectors with the N unit vectors, it would be through a rotation matrix N. So this property, the property that C prime prime equals C prime times C, composition of successive rotations follows this. And so it's very important because eventually when we talk about Euler angles, this we're gonna use this property. And we might have you know, more than one rotation. Maybe we'll have three. I don't know. Maybe it's worth before going on to things, uh, just look at an example to try to get one of these matrices. All right. So this is, this is an example from the book. I think it's example three one. You should look at it. But it describes a, it just starts out writing what a B frame is in terms of N. So it says that B one equals, and I think we, we had a way of reminding ourselves if something was written in terms of the N frame. So this is zero, one, zero. B two equals one, zero, zero. And B three equals zero, zero, negative one. You might go, what's, what's that all about? Uh, well, first we'd have to verify, maybe this is something to do. Verify that this is a right-handed coordinate system or what we said, right-handed frame. It's a right-handed triad of unit vectors. For this to be a right-handed triad of unit vectors, we need that B1 cross B2 equals B3. And is that the case? It's kind of weird because this says, um, if I were to draw N1, N2, and N3, here's how it's defining the B frame. It's saying that B1 is equal in the, is in the N2 direction. B2 is in the N1 direction. And then it says that B3 is in the negative N3 direction. Now, after drawing it, we could see, you use the right-hand rule, B1 cross B2, and my thumb is pointing down. So good, this is a right-handed coordinate frame. If uh, like here, it was kind of easy because these are in plus or minus of the n directions. What if it wasn't? If it wasn't, then we'd have to verify this. And one way to do it is that way I've written before for how you write the cross product as matrix multiplication. And if you remember that, this would be B1. This equation of the cross product becomes B1 tilde times B2, and what is that? B1 tilde times B2. Well, the way that we describe this uh, tilde matrix, um, and if you want, it's actually in uh, its equation 3.23 for how to write this. It would be zero, there's zeros along the diagonal, and then you put the different components this is going to be kind of hard to write. So this would be negative B1, the first component, no, the third component, 
And then this is B1, the second component, and then negative B1, the first component. And it's a skew symmetric matrix. So on the other side of the diagonal, we just flip the signs. It's B1, 1, negative B1, 2, B1, 3. And for this particular case, uh, the only non-zero element is uh, B1, 2. The others are zero. So this is, this is B2, 1, B2, 2, B2, 3. Okay. And we know what that is. So what do we have here? This is 0, 0, 0, uh, 0, 1, 0, 0. Oh negative one, zero. And this is one, zero, zero. So now it's matrix multiplication that we can do. Uh, okay, that's zero, zero. Negative one times one is negative one. Oh, what do you know? That equals B3. So it checks out. It is right-handed. You might be wondering, why am I even checking this? It'll come up later when you have to define a frame based on the moment of inertia for a rigid body. If you use computational tools, they'll just give you three directions, but you have to order them in the right way that they produce a right-handed coordinate frame. Anyway, okay, so it checks out. It's right-handed coordinate frame. That's good. That means all of our stuff about uh, uh, direction cosine matrices is good to go. Now, suppose we want to get the matrix that relates the B and N unit vectors. So what is the matrix C that satisfies B equals C N? So the type of matrix we've been describing. And is there some shortcut well, there is, if you remember what C involved, and I'll just write, if I were to write the top row, this would be B1 dotted with N1 plus, no, not plus. And then the next entry is B1 dotted with N2, then B1 dotted with N3, and so on for the rest of the matrix. So this is the same as if we were to write B1, but write it as a row vector. And so these dot, dot, dots just mean, take that vector up above, that's a column, make it into a row. And then next, same for B2 and same for B3. So we could read off, and the book in the example writes them as uh, row vectors and then transpose. So it makes it easier to write. So this is 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, and then 0, 0, negative 1. So that's our matrix. The, the book uses what it calls uh, explicit frame, um, writing things explicitly in terms of how one frame is related to another. So if we were to talk about explicit frame notation, it's that B equals, and we write the matrix C as BN. So this matrix would be BN. So that's another way to write it. And if we had some other frame, so if we had, and this is in the example, it's got talks about an N frame. I don't, I mean, I, I don't want to write this B frame. I guess I could, but here's some kind of random B frame. And then it calls it an F frame. F, why F? I don't know. So if you were given um, F and B, meaning you're told what the F unit directions are in terms of the B unit directions. Then to help you remember that, instead of C prime or something, you could write FB. And then B equals BN 
think of Spanish. Muy bien. And then if you wanted to relate the F directions to the N directions, well, that's some currently unknown matrix, F, N, but you could work out what it is. And it's that F, N equals F, B, B, N. And so this is kind of uh, nice to write it this way because it's kind of like these two Bs that are next to each other, you know, cancel each other out, they annihilate. So you might look at that example to get going for uh, understanding how we do these rigid bodies and matrices and whatnot. Okay. I think in the last five minutes, I can start describing something. We'll do Euler angles next time, but before we do Euler angles, there's something called the kinematic differential equation. The kinematic differential equation tells us how the orientation of the frame, the body fixed frame, is changing as a function of time related to the angular velocity. So here's some kind of, here's an angular velocity vector. And often when you write the angular velocity vector, this is relating how this B frame, the blue frame, rotates with respect to some other frame, the red inertially fixed frame. So to describe that, we need, it's probably good to draw a picture here. Here's my favorite shape. I don't know if these are perpendicular to the faces or not, but there it is. Then there's some inertially fixed directions. And then there's some angular velocity. Ah, angular velocity. This, is, this angular velocity vector relates the B and the N frame. So that's the notation we've used. In general, it's changing with time. How is it changing with time? It's changing with time due to dynamics, which we'll get to later in chapter four, but it will be changing with time. So we could say omega is a function of time. The angular velocity that relates the B frame with respect to the N frame is changing in time. And this change in time, this will affect the instantaneous orientation or attitude of the rigid body, or equivalently, the orientation of the B frame with respect to the N frame, which is summed up through the C matrix. So the C matrix will change with time. And there's some relationship between how the C matrix changes in time and this omega vector. We can write the components of omega Right, just like any other vector, omega is a vector that we could write with respect to write it with in components of either the body fixed frame or the inertial frame. It will be easier to deal with when we write it in terms of the body fixed frame. So we write omega one B one plus omega two B two plus omega three B three. These are just the instantaneous components. And the, the B directions are changing. So how is B changing? The B directions, the output BI directions are changing. Meaning, uh, let's start with B1. So B1, if we were to take the derivative with respect to the N frame, now we use the transport equation. We would say, well, derivative, with respect to the B frame of B1 plus omega cross B1. But B unit vectors do not change with respect to the B unit vectors. So that's zero. And all we're left with is omega cross B1. And we could summarize this in terms of this vectrix notation, omega cross each one of these Individually. This is easier in the compact notation. It's the time rate of change of this vectrix equals omega cross the vectrix. But now in place of omega, uh, right, we're, we'll write this cross product in terms of that tilde operator. 
we'll stop there and continue next time. What we'll be getting to is how that C matrix changes in time.